SJC News, St. John Church News. Here's your anchor, Sandra Dorsey. Good morning, virtual family, and welcome to today's edition of SJC News. In recognition of Black History Month, we pause to highlight a piece of our heritage. Today, we recognize John Mercer Langston. He was the first black man to become a lawyer when he passed the bar in Ohio in 1854. He was then elected to the post of town clerk for Brown Helm, Ohio in 1855, becoming one of the first African-Americans ever elected to public office in America. John Mercer Langston was also the great uncle of Langston Hughes, the famed poet of the Harlem Renaissance. I encourage you each week to take a moment, calm through your history, and then share what you've learned with others. Each one, teach one. The virtual memorial service for Sister Valerie Stinson will be held on February 19th at 1 p.m. The details on how you can be a part of that service will be shared this week. Thank you to all of our members who came out to support our helping hands, feeding through faith ministry, and to serve those in need on yesterday. If you are interested in supporting or serving, please contact Sister Messiah Williams. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. Prayer is our greatest tool in our daily battles of life. Join us every Monday and Friday at 7 a.m. for prayer. Remember to support St. John with your stewardship and trust God with what he has so graciously entrusted you with. Exodus 35 and 5 says, From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering. That concludes today's edition of SJC News. Be informed, stay connected, and stand on faith knowing that our God can do anything but fail. Now here's Donya Albright. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning. And welcome once again to a wonderful day that the Lord has made. This is truly a blessing to be with you. I welcome you to our virtual worship experience once again on this, the second Sunday of the second month in the new year, 2022. February, the second Sunday is a blessing. It's happy heritage month for you as well. We thank you for your willingness to tune in each week. And we look forward to sharing with you our heritage highlights. Thank you so much for your willingness to support us, not only through the virtual broadcast, but certainly through your act of stewardship. Listen, I need for you to join me this week to make sure that you're giving of the Lord and giving that which the Lord has promised to you. God has promised to take care of us. And I think that we owe the Lord much more than we are sharing with the Lord. So I want you to trust God in your giving this week. Matter of fact, let's trust God all month long in our giving so that we're able to do the kingdom building that God has encouraged us to do in the midst of this wonderful, amazing new year. I invite you again today back to the same text that we shared in last week. I invite you to join me now in John's gospel. And in John's gospel, I want you to join me in that fourth chapter. And specifically, I want you to hear God speak to us. This day is a day that the Lord is going to bless us. Let's go to the word. And before we do, before we go to the word, let's invite God into our space, turning wherever we are into the Lord's sanctuary. Let us go to God in prayer. God, on these few moments together, we pray for your goodness and your grace. 
We ready ourselves to receive the word that you have deposited in your servant. We pray that you would remove this, your servant, so that your word might come through and bless all of us. We pray that it will strengthen us in our weak moments. We pray that it would build us where the world and the weariness of the world has torn us down. We pray, O oh God, that you would speak to us in a way that we're able to receive the glory of God in this day. We ask and we invite you in to have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Family, this morning, I thank you for your willingness to join me to invite God into our sacred space. Now let's go to work in John chapter four at this time. John's Gospel, chapter four, verses 46 through 54. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was a royal official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you all see signs and wonders, you will never believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when his son began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday, about the seventh hour, the fever left him, which is about 1 p.m. The father knew that that was the hour when he and Jesus had spoken. Your son, Jesus, he recalled, will live. And he believed himself, and the whole household which was his believed. Now, this was the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Amen. The Lord would not release us from this text, for there was one more lesson I believe God has for us and God impressed upon me today. The subject for this Sunday sermon is simple. I walked away and still believe. I walked away and still believed. In the hot summer of the year 1914, a summer evening just before midnight, an explosion ripped through a Ohio town. In this particular town, there was an African-American man who was sleeping in his home. And when he heard the explosion, he jumped up, not sure what had taken place, not knowing whether there was an attack on his home or knowing whether his family had experienced some type of tragedy. You see, in that year, 1914, in the great state of Ohio, there were many different tragedies that were happening. They were connected over the time period. And so there was a, an anxiety that every time something happened, an explosion, a, a loud boom, that there was something dangerous taking place. So this kind of anxiety rested upon many of the African-American citizens and white citizens in this particular Ohio city. It was intriguing that around that midnight, that explosion took place and the African-American man jumped up to check his family and he discovered that Errol was well in the family. For he had reason to worry though, for the last few years, matter of fact, the last 26 months, he had been working, attempting to sell a patent that he had just re re recently gotten approval for, a U.S. patent. He had been peddling a contraption that he and his brother were going through the city streets trying to get people to invest in. You know, everyone who has a business, whether it's a hustle or it's your full-time experience, understands that starting from the ground zero floor, the grassroots experience, that sometimes you don't have the backing that you need and you have to push your product the best way you can. This brother, this African-American man pushed a product that he had been given clarity and, and clear, uh, had the ability to sell it, but nobody was biting. He went to door after door and 
gave his testimony. He gave his salesman pitch, if you will, and doors closed in his face a number of times. He had to walk away, but he still believed in the product that he had produced day after day, week after week, month after month, after getting the United States to give him a patent on this particular contraption, he still had people that would not take a chance on him. He would knock on the doors daily and have to walk away, yet still believing in the very product he produced. But on this amazing night, when that explosion erupted and he heard it and he jumped to make sure that all was well in his home, a few moments later, a knock came to the door. He went to answer the door and it was the white city chief of police. He'd come and he had dust on his face. He had tears in his eyes and his clothes was, were tattered and singed by smoke. And he came coughing and others surrounded him. They demanded, they didn't ask, they demanded that this young man come with them to assist them as they shared with him an explosion had taken place down around Lake Erie. And around Lake Erie, there were people who were trapped underneath this kind of firebombed explosion. They told him that a gas leak had taken place and an explosion took place and there were people trapped underneath and they had already lost some persons who were trying to pull survivors from this particular explosion. And they expressed to him, we need your help. We're not asking, we're demanding that you would get yourself together and come on down to assist us in helping hopefully save some persons who were trapped underneath. The young man didn't even change his clothes, just grabbed his boots and in the middle of his pajamas, he got up, reached his brother, and they both in their pajamas and their boots grabbed the contraptions that they had been attempting to get people to invest in. And they got in their car and they drove down to Lake Erie and the canal where the explosion took place. They were the first two to place on the contraptions and they went in and that particular night they were willing to do whatever it took to help save the lives of persons who were trapped in that particular explosion. And family, as the night rolled on and as the day began, the dawn began to break, they had saved a few lives. There were some who died, but they had saved more lives than was expected to. The city newspaper began to blow up how this African-American man and his brother and their contraption were able to go into an exploded building and pull persons out and help them survive. They even had a picture of the young man running into the building with the contraption in his hand and his pajamas and his boots on. Beloved, it was not until that moment that people at that moment began to believe in the product that Garrett Augustus Morgan had put together and he saved many lives. We know this contraption and this product as the gas mask. Brothers and sisters, at that explosion taking place, when that explosion took place, it was all that they had. No one believed in them. They had been going from door to door, knocking on door after door, being rejected. They had to walk away and still believe that their product was sufficient. Garrett Augustus Morgan was inspired by God to do the work and hear this. I want you to understand this family. The Garrett had been inspired by God only a couple of years previously because of other explosions that had taken place where immigrants and blacks were losing their lives due to smoke inhalation. There was something that clicked in his mind by God, he declares. It was God who inspired him to create a contraption, a product that would hopefully save the lives of persons who were dealing with smoke that had got into their systems. My brothers and sisters, he went from door to door for 26 months attempting to get persons to buy in. To, to, he wanted to sell his product, but no one, beloved, would believe in the product. He walked away from many doors, but still believed. 
Beloved, we know what it's like. Business persons know what it's like. Children who sell products for schools, parents who sell products for the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts. We all know what it's like to knock on doors, to ask people questions for, to ask them to support the initiatives that we have. Pastors who serve in churches understand that every week we knock on the door of parishioners' hearts, encouraging them, asking them to support the movement that God has given to build the kingdom through their particular parish, often to be told, I don't believe it. Often to be told, I'm not interested. Often to be told that not this day. We walk away and we still believe in the product that we are attempting to sell or to push or to get investors for. Beloved brothers and sisters, we know what that's like. I've come to tell you today, have you, while not selling, while not pushing, while not attempting to gain investors in material products. When was the last time you set yourself down and realized that you've had to walk away from some of the d disgusting, frustrating, and challenging circumstances that God has ushered into your life? You've had to walk away from the presence of our God and still believe that miracles are possible. Today we find again, you know his story, a Roman official, a regal employee of the state, a person who works for the state, the head of state, an individual whose life and service had been given for a government, discovered that his son was ill and the illness was so bad family that the young father had family to find a way to get help. He had heard that Jesus was in town for a second time. He had heard about the power of God moving through Jesus Christ. He had heard that there was this preacher, this potential miracle worker that was coming through town again. How to hear it? Well, there was a miracle that took place in Cana where he was headed. Earlier, he had heard that he had turned water into wine. And there he'd heard that there was something special and unique about him. And he believed that this man named Jesus had the ability to do something about his situation. I told you last week and the week before that this brother actually comes to Jesus already believing. What you have to understand is that the word believe in John's gospel is the baseline for faith. In Mark's gospel and in, in Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel, the word believe may have a different connotation. But in the gospel of John, the word believe is the familiar word for having faith. Pistos is the Greek word that John calls it. It means to embrace, to come to connection and conviction about that which is presented. This man had a belief that Jesus could do something about his son. He walked for seven miles. I never, I've never shared that with you, but he had to leave Capernaum and come to Cape. And when he went from one place to another, it was not an easy track, like walking down a, a, a solid street. There, there was nothing easy about this journey. He had to go uphill and down mountains. He had to go around some places. And in essence, it was a tough journey, but he had to get there because his son had reached the point where he would die if something did not take place. Oh, my brothers and sisters, he came believing. He came hoping. He came knowing that Jesus had done a miracle for someone else. And it's possible he could do the same for, for him, his son. He comes to Jesus. And Jesus responds in a way that seems unusual. I told you last week he had, Jesus had some ambivalence about it. Brothers and sisters, Jesus responds to the man's request. Sir, will you come? to see about my child because he's at the point of death. Jesus' response was a shock to the system. Jesus' response should shock you. He says to the man, unless you all see signs and wonders, you fail to believe. Can I share with you? What really is happening here is that Jesus is challenging this man. He comes to him, Jesus, and the man meet. The man says, I know you can do something. I've got a belief in you. 
But Jesus is not excited, nor does he respond in the same way he responded to the centurion soldier that we hear about in other gospels. Jesus responds to the centurion soldier by saying, I'm amazed at the level of your faith and your child is made well because you believe. He does not respond this way to this man, to this Roman official. Have you ever come to the Lord, our God, because you have seen, heard, read about what he has done in the lives of other persons and you come the same way they have and you say to God through Christ Jesus, I need the same thing you've done for somebody else. I ask that you would do it for me. He, he asked it. He says, will you come with me? The history is that Jesus would go. But in this instance, Jesus is not impressed. Jesus is not moved. Jesus is not even excited by the fact that a man has come of royal heritage and government assistance, working job, to say, won't you come? Jesus pushes this man. He challenges this man. And I've come to announce today that there are moments right now that we're experiencing that we've come to the Lord in faith and hope that he would do something about that which is in trouble in our life. And the response of Jesus is not excitement. It is not overwhelming joy. It is not even an attempt to say, my child. He responds to us like he responds to the father, the Roman official in the text and says, unless you see a sign, unless you experience a wonder. In essence, what Jesus says to him, family, is this. You all want proof, what we call demonstrative proof that I can do something. The father says to Jesus, I need you to come with me. And Jesus' response is go back where you come from. I ain't coming. In essence, this father has to walk away and still believe that Jesus has the power to do something. My brother and sister, have you? I know I have. I've had to walk away from the presence of the Lord. I've come to church. I've worshiped. I've celebrated, I've believed, I've prayed, I've danced, I've shouted, I've fasted. And the Lord's response was not to give a demonstrative proof by changing my situation in that moment. I want you to know that some of us are like this father, this Roman official. We have what I call around the corner faith or what now you can say, I have demonstrative proof faith, which is to say, I'll believe as long as these things take place. Jesus challenges the father in the text and he challenges us right now in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of struggle and strength, in the midst of a country that is bordering the potential of a war with, a, a, with Russia and other, and other countries around them, in the midst of a country that is wrestling with economic instability, in the midst of a country that is trying to ignore the issues of social justice for African Americans, in the midst of a country who will not, I'll say this and I'm angry about it, it's the truth, who refuses to indict and to prosecute persons who a year ago climbed walls and produced what has nothing or no other way to say this but this, an insurrection. And yet nothing has been done. How many of us have had to go to the Lord, praise God from whom all blessings flow, pray, Read scripture fast, talk God's talk, speak God's language, and yet walk away from the church without an answer. My brother and sister, we've all, or should if you haven't, keep on living. We all will have the experience that this father has. I have to walk away and still believe. This situation is rough. What do we do? 
First, you have to understand that the Lord is challenging us, is pushing us. The Lord is telling you and me when we have to walk away and still believe there is something that God wants to develop in the very faith that we came to him with. I come to announce today that the faith that you and I come to God with through Christ Jesus may, as I said in weeks past, may be insufficient for what the Lord is attempting to develop in you and me right now. Oh, there are churches. It's not just personally. There are corporate situations where congregations have been living on faith of the past, living on the faith of the ancestors, those who've been dead a long time, living on the acumen, living on the, watch this, living on the success of years past. And now in circumstances that the congregations in the world are facing, we are no longer able to look back at their testimony and live. We have got to grow in our faith and confront what the Lord has become silent. Or shall I say this, maybe not silent, but what the Lord has said, I ain't doing a sign. I'm not doing anything wondrous. I'm not, I'm not doing a demonstrative proof. I am telling you to go back to your homes. I am telling you to go back to your jobs. I'm telling you to go back to the relationships that you have been fasting and praying for a difference to be made by me. Go back to them and do me a favor. Just believe. Jesus is telling us as he is sharing with this man, this Roman official, this father, let your faith, your belief, be sufficient for whatever you are dealing with. Let there not be, here it is, when you and I have to walk away and still believe, the challenge is for us to release, to let go, to be done with the conditions, the constraints, and here it is, the condition, the constraint, and the borders that we have placed on Jesus to do something about our situation. I don't know if you realize this, but we all have put a box around, a border around, a constraint around, a limit around how God through Christ Jesus can make miracles out of our issues at home. And maybe they're not at home. Maybe they are in the place that we love. We have all kind of boxed God in to how God can work through Christ Jesus in those circumstances. In essence, I am suggesting that each and every one of us who's looking and listening has parameters around how God through Christ Jesus can work the miracle that is necessary for our circumstances to live. The Father has come with belief, faith in Jesus but he's got parameters around how Jesus can actually make the difference. Oh, don't laugh at him. Don't say that's not me because we all have that. And the challenge that Jesus has issued to the father, the Roman official is the same challenge he's issuing to you and me. Release your borders, release your confining boxes, Get outside of what's familiar and comfortable and watch me do something that you didn't think I could do if I didn't do it the way you suspected. Come here. Come here. Each one of us right now has a parameter, a boundary, a constraint, a limitation around how God will work through Jesus Christ to, to bring relief and healing to the circumstances we're in. Maybe you are limiting God only to work through medicine. But you know, God has the ability to work through natural herbs as well. What we call home remedies sometimes still work. I know all of us who need finances and need financial support only believe God can give finances and financial support through the banks. And God has said to me and to you, I will have a bank tell you no, not because I don't believe 
in what you're doing, not because I have not created the vision for it and the need for it in society. But I need you to know that you've got to take the parameter, the limitation of me supplying the need for your vision through one bank. You need to know that I can move on the hearts of people in a way that you've never imagined and they will finance what you need and you don't even have to go to a bank. Take the boundaries off. This father, you don't believe me? Let me show it to you and I'm, I'm gonna get out of here. The father says to Jesus, I believe you can do it, but I need for you to come with me. His faith is around the corner faith in that he believes based on condition. The condition that the young man, the father, is looking for his son to be healed with is he believes Jesus can do it if he comes home. The home front sent the father to get Jesus to come with him. You missed it. Some of us leave home with the only belief that God through Christ Jesus can change our circumstances by coming back with us. We have a way, a formula and a format. Let me hear if you have not been listening the last month or so, what I am pushing, what God has placed in my spiritual belly to birth into the people who are looking and listening is this truth. God works beyond your perception, your perspective, and hear this clearly, God works in ways that you don't comprehend. In essence, I'm trying to help everyone listening and looking over the last month understand this reality. You see the world one way because you don't know the other ways that God is orchestrating and moving and showing other people how things can be done. I shared this in the Bible study a couple of weeks ago with Pastor Cooper, that persons who enter a sanctuary and face the direction of the pulpit and the choir loft cannot see what's behind them unless they turn completely around. But those who are in the choir loft and the pulpit actually can see more than those who sit in the pew come. So your view of the challenge or the circumstance is different. Jesus is forcing this father to realize something. As you come to me one way, I don't have to go with you in order to do something about your situation. I'm pushing this truth. God is still God through Christ Jesus, making a difference, building the kingdom, doing the ministry and making a difference in the world, even beyond the way you think it should be done. The father has to walk away and still believe. I, I am really amazed that God looked at this man, heard his faith and declared there's more in you. That, that's, that's what I'm recognizing about God in this season. God's push to develop the church beyond the sanctuary. God's push to, to force us to enjoy virtual spaces are because God does not want our faith limited to demonstrativeness, whereby if we don't sit in a building and if we don't sit on pews or chairs, we have not worshiped. Honey, God has been attempting to get us to understand that worship expands beyond what we have been comfortable with. And I've come to tell you, you might as well get used to some things. I've come to tell us, we might as well forget some of the ways we've always done it. There is a new, I told you in January, God is doing a new thing and the new thing is something that you should have perceived in the months before. God is trying to elevate you. God is trying to answer our prayer. The question is, will we take the boundaries off? And I know some of you are like, oh man, I'm free. I have no boundaries. Do you really? Have you really taken the boundaries off of God? If that's the case, then why hasn't the situation changed? You have to walk away and still believe even when God through Christ Jesus is not moving 
and not doing things the way you see fit. Oh, hear me, family. Jesus tells the brother, I don't have to do a demonstrative faith in order for your son to be made well. Maybe he's telling us the same thing. I don't have to do what makes you comfortable and, and I don't have to go along with what you believe is just. I, I want you to understand this. One of the problems we're having in the world is people believe that their perception of their reality and the world is the only one. They believe it's, it's the right way. Honey, let me remind you that right is relative to the circumstance you find yourself in. There is always more than one way. There is always more insight to be developed and learned. I I'm trying to help you. That God often orchestrates things the way God does, not because we are in the wrong, not because we've done something that we, that we should not have, but God is attempting you and me to grow beyond what we have been comfortable with. This is something churches have to come to grips with. You have to get beyond what you're used to, what's comfortable, watch this, for you. Vision will never be accomplished as long as people are not willing to be uncomfortable and use faith. You've got to use faith in ways that are uncomfortable for you. Growth and development in the kingdom of God never takes place without uncomfort. This father came expecting God through Jesus to do something by going home with him. Never miss this reality. The father says, I need you to come home with me. In essence, I need everybody to see that you're coming with me and that's going to make the difference. And the Lord says, you may go. Your son will live. Last week, I told you that the father had to leave with only a promise, only a word. This week, I want to close it by saying this to you and also reminding this reality to myself. The father has to travel without what he came with. Let, let me see. Let me see. He has to, in essence, release the boundaries, the confinements the limitations that he had placed on Jesus to work the miracle that was necessary. He's got to let that go. And he has to walk away from the very presence of Jesus without getting what he believes is necessary for his son to be healed. Have you had to leave everything you believed was necessary in order for healing and deliverance and difference to be made in your life, have you had to give up wanting to work in a particular company, wanting to have a particular kind of situation in order for you to recognize that the Lord can bless in a way you never imagined? Help me, Holy Spirit. Someone listening, someone looking is wrestling with the reality that God has not come in the way you've wanted. You've got to walk away every week, but still believe that the difference is going to be made. Come, come close. You, I have a lot of love for this Roman official who's a father because he leaves Jesus's presence without what he asked for. And he has to travel seven hours by foot. You know, traveling home seven hours means that this brother family has to spend the night between leaving Jesus in Canaan and Capernaum to go back home. He cannot make the trip in one day. It's too much. And so he has to stay overnight between home and Jesus. I don't know if you have had the experience, but I have, where I had to leave the presence of the Lord, spend the night and get up and keep going, not knowing 
if what I've prayed about and left in the hands of God has actually turned out in the way that my request to God through Christ Jesus has been offered. This father has not only to release the con from the confines, the limits, the constraints, the boundaries, the borders. He not only has to do that, but here is something he has to do. He has to survive the midnight hours not knowing, but still believing. <clears throat> what I am asking now is the second thing. I'm asking this question. How long can your certainty combat uncertainty? How long can you withstand the pressure and the debate of not knowing and still believe? This father has to sleep through the night worrying about whether his child has died or is alive. All he has is what the Lord told him, which was he'll live. Remember last week I told you, you don't know how he's going to live. You don't know what condition he's going to live through. All he knows is my son will live. He's got to sleep. Uh, to be honest, how much sleep would you get? I don't know that I would get much sleep. If, if, if I left church, meaning the presence of God, and didn't come home with what I believed was necessary for me and mine to be made whole. Could you come with the expectation of one thing and leave not getting what you expected and still believe what the Lord has told you? This is what churches are experiencing. This is what we have to experience when life is not ushering us into what we want, how we want it, and when we want it, or when people have decided, honey, you can't do that. I know you think this is the way it should be, but let me remind you that that's not it. And when your boss, your supervisor, the boss or the president or the leadership says, I know you want it this way, honey, that's because you don't know what we know. We're going another way. Have you had to walk away and still believe what the Lord said about your life and the situation? All things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and are called according to his prayer. Do you believe it? This father has to spend the night, get up in the morning and still roll, not knowing what the end will be. All he has is what the Lord told him. He has to battle through the night. And I want to be honest, some of the riches, most important lessons we will learn will not come because we have gotten the answers that we've wanted when we wanted them. But some of our faith, some of our strongest moments in faith have been developed, get this family, when? When we've had to battle within, when the faith we do have has to speak to the uncertainty and the anxiety that continues to manifest itself every week. It ain't going to happen. Are you sure? I don't think it'll go down that way. I think it's going to be this. I'm convinced. And here's something you need to understand. That once we convince ourselves that it is a certain way, it will take God moving. We're used to this. We, we would say God has to move demonstratively to do this, to change my mind. God got to strike me. God got to do X, Y, Z. I won't believe unless it happens this way. Remember, the father has had to take that away and I'm challenging you, take away what you think, what you feel, what you, you consider to be righteous. Take away, remove the border of it. And when you do, watch the words of Jesus say, he'll live. He'll live. In essence, Jesus says to the father, I ain't gotta go in order for this to be done. I will beat you there. Hello, somebody. The Lord speaks to him and is already where his son is. Come here. 
You've got to have the ability to battle within, to confront uncertainty from within. Some of the problems we're facing are not with people. They are from within. If you can get beyond yourself, oh church, oh Christian community, if you can get beyond yourself, you think this should be this way. You got to get beyond that, honey. God is operating in a way that's beyond you. And God is trying to grow your faith. Just like Jesus is growing this man. So he leaves. I'm done. I'm finished. He leaves, has to go home and spend the night battle uncertainty. And I'm going to be honest. Sometimes you're not going to win. There are times between God answering the prayer and, and, and giving the relief that you need, family, that you aren't going to win some days. Just being honest. Some days the uncertainty in your life will overwhelm you. Some days the pain and the suffering are going to get the best of you. Some days the injustices against our communities are going to overwhelm us in ways that we don't have the strength to fight back on a particular day. That's when the blues comes. That's when the spirituals come. And that's when you hear the words of the spirituals say, nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus and me. That's when you hear the gospel writer say, precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. That's when you hear those words come into fruition. When you have been frustrated because it has not happened the way you wanted. That's growing faith. You wouldn't have precious Lord from Thomas Dorsey if it had not been for a moment like that when his family and his wife had died and he had to hear that it wasn't nothing he could do about it. We wouldn't have some of the moments in our historical significance. Let me give you another heritage highlight. Let me give you one more and I'm taking my seat. In 1904, a lady by the name of Mary McLeod Bethune was so moved by the spirit of God that she wanted to start a school for girls. But the school was to be a Christian school. Hear me, Mary McLeod Bethune had gone to seminary. I, 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 I just want to pause. And I want everybody who's listening at me and looking to understand that any movement that has been for the betterment of our people has been born and moved through the church, not outside, but through it. There is a cultural dynamic now that believes that we can have a better community and a better world by moving around and without the church. I am here to tell you, you cannot have it. Look at your history. Every movement that has taken place that has bettered humanity for African-Americans and the world has taken place through the church. Mary McLeod Bethune graduated from a seminary. She learned to read and write by going to a seminary. She has a seminary degree. That's how she was moved and came to believe and came to know that God could do anything. Her vision for her school would not have happened had she not come through the seminary. 1904, because of vision from God, she wanted to make a difference. And so she starts by going to an old rundown building and placing $1.50 down on, get this, an $11 a month mortgage. She, in her own words, says this, I frequented trash cans. I frequented dumpsters behind hotels and restaurants. 
I looked for supplies. I found old barrels, those big barrels, old barrels and crates that had housed food and drink. And I brought them, get this, I brought them, family, Mary McLeod Bethune says, I brought them and turned them in to desk and chairs. Crates were chairs, barrels were turned into desk for her students, end quote. She went to get pledges by going door to door. And some of the people she would go door to door with, she had to walk away without any money. After she had poured her vision for her school out to them, she walked away sometimes not having a dime, but still having to believe. She said it was a great cross to bear and that would hurt my feelings when people would not give money to what I was proposing. But what she said was I always smiled and still believe. Come here. When things are not going the way you want them to go, when you aren't able to manipulate and turn the circumstances in the direction you want, can you walk away and still believe that the power of our God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything you can ask or imagine? The father leaves, and as he leaves, on his way back home, servants meet him in the middle of the day and say, boss, we just come to tell you, your son lives, he's well. Hear, hear the growth in this man's faith. You need to hear this. He says, this is a growing faith. This is a faith that has grown. This man says, about what time did his transformation take place? This is not doubt. This is faith that's looking to go even deeper. And they say, about 1 p.m., boss. And the man in his own heart realizes that that's the very moment that he was challenged by Jesus to leave, to walk away and still believe. Come here for a minute. The very place that you meet your challenge from God through Jesus Christ to leave, to walk back into the storm, but believe, to walk away from being told no, but believe, to have your knock, your, your block knocked off, but still believe. Come here, church. To have God use your leadership, your pastor, to tell you it ain't going down like that. It's going down this way. And you still have to get yourself together and believe that the Lord is doing it and moving it and blessing it and growing it and developing it. And it's still good even when you don't agree with it. Come here. The father says, at the moment the challenge is issued, the change comes. I hope that you can walk away and still believe. I hope that you can be like the father. And when he realizes it, he comes to grow even more in faith. And watch this, his transformation is because his family comes to believe. Oh, it's a blessing when everybody in your family can have faith that God through Christ can do anything. When everybody in the family can say, trust in the Lord, lean not to your own understanding. When everybody in the family has the courage to say, I know the Lord will make a way somehow. When everybody in the house can say along with you, do not be dismayed. Whatever be your tiding, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love of life. Be encouraged. Have a great week. And remember, you may have to walk away and still believe. Take care. Thank you.